Hi, so I'm Elizabeth Vijaya. I'm an assistant professor of East Asian cinema at the University of Toronto, and I'm giving a talk on the aesthetics of passivity through um, Tsai Ming Liang's Walker series. So thank you so much for this opportunity to give a hope talk. I like the title of this uh, talk, and I hope that my presentation is uh, will be evident that it is precisely on hope. So I'm going to speak about Tsai Ming Liang's No No Slip exhibition that was at the Museum of National Taipei University of Education um, in that ran from 26 March to 24th April in 2016. And during the exhibition, the museum opened from 6 p.m. to midnight on weekdays and hours were extended to daybreak on weekends. So on, and on the first floor, the film No No Sleep was projected on two screens. And then on the second floor, the films Autumn Days and Journey to the West alternated. The third floor was dedicated to screenings of Journey to the West and at 7am, the screen became less visible, almost dematerializing. On the first floor, the nightscape of the film No No Sleep um, shines against the breaking light of day, entering through the museum's large lattice glass windows. And the sleeping bodies, the somnambulating bodies, the children brushing their teeth, they all appear no less cinematic than the flickers within the looping screen. So, this talk proposes that the Walker series and the exhibition of two of the films from the series at the Museum for the Polyphonic Rhythms of what I'm calling an aesthetics of passivity. And returning to the root of aesthetics as sensory perception, the term aesthetics of passivity is meant to highlight the way Thai cinema foregrounds the sensuality of perception through the radical slowing down of character movements, the reduction of plot-based action, and the lengthening short duration in order to emphasize, rather than cut away from, quotidian acts such as walking or sleeping. So the concept behind the series is simple. Dressed as a monk, the actor Li Kangshen walks or rests at an astoundingly slow pace across different locations. The films do not completely abandon the cinematic devices of narrative and character. And through a slow rhythm of cuts and on-screen action by the focal character, even as the passers-by in the scene maintain a conventional pace, relational and cinematic tensions remain discernible. So with this minimal approach to narrative, which draws attention to the rhythms of fleshly and vulnerable bodies in distant social existence, Thai's cinema of passivity reclaims time itself and the interrelational possibilities within it as the focus of the cinematic experience. So in so doing, the Walker series shows the tension between the action and non-action, movement and non-movement at work in the cinematic medium and suggests that the potential of cinema lies not in where a work is screened but in its ability to create experiential moments for alternative rhythms and shapes of collective existence. So reading Thai's form of slow cinema through the aesthetics of passivity, I stress the ethical dimension of slow cinema and its minimal power to disrupt conventional rhythms and ways of thinking collective actions and being. So while the films are stripped of outwardly dramatic actions, on the level of desire and also as the exhibition conditions of No No Sleep shows, the cinema of passivity is not an ascetic cinema of renunciation. The spectator is invited to experience the interrelation of time, existence and queer attachments within a multifarious cinematic world that lingers on as a counterforce to rhythms of rapid progress and productivity. So even when figures on screen and the spectators off screen seem to be separated by differences marked by silence or arrhythmias, and very little seems to be happening, the Walker series reveals the bodily entwinement between ethical and social existence. On-screen passivity welcomes a spectatorial passivity. So with the minimal and slow-paced action on screen, the spectator is free to luxuriate in the rhythmic interplay within and between the filmic world and the world the spectator is embedded in. With the slowness on screen freeing the audience to look away, to sleep and even to dream, there is a chance for attunement towards the passive nature of co-belonging underpinned by an interrelationality that is always already there, even before the formation or action of an individual. Thai's aesthetics of passivity and the soporific screening conditions of the No No Sleep exhibition invites not 
just an intellectual consideration of the ethics of social existence, but creates the conditions in which the audience can have a corporeal experience of distant intimacy, shared vulnerability and lying horizontally together while sheltered by the light of the screen. The disorienting tendencies of the Walker series and its horizontal inclinations have the potential to disrupt sedimented modes of orientation with embedded hierarchies such as the mitim of East and West. The aesthetics of passivity thus draws attention to the ethical significance of passive gestures such as retiring, withdrawing, lying down, sleeping, moving slowly and waiting. So in and through these films, queer desire radius, with the horizontal bend of the bodies on screen and in the exhibition, the rhythm and direction of the films disrupt the notion of time conceived of as forward momentum. So by challenging cinematic conventions of narrative development with the downward force of the soporific, the film offers an alternative to the visual language and ideology of progress and development. So in the spaces for cinema and spaces within cinema, there's thus the possibility of dwelling for longer in the spacing between action and a return to the vibrations of the body in its minimal movements. For example, in the coda of the film No No Sleep, we watch the vibrational intensities of flesh on screen in the moment between sleep and wakefulness, doubled by another body in a similar but separate space. So through the camera and editing, the mundane act of getting to sleep becomes a corporal drama of social existence, even when it seems that the body is alone in an enclosed space. Beyond the scenes of suggestive same-sex desire, in its languorous pace, the Walker series embraces the bodily vulnerability and intimacies of everyday acts. The undercurrents of queer desire in the series creates divergent rhythms of collective existence that challenge the normalization of heteronormative and capitalist modes of existence. The celebratory mode of the No No Sleep exhibition shows that even with the portrayal of fatigue and languid bodies, the aesthetics of passivity harbors space for queer attachments and does not necessitate the relinquishing of worldly pleasures. There are ethical and political stakes to a reconsideration of passivity and its minimal productive potential. Attunement to ethical responsibility can arise from doing very little, almost nothing, particularly while collectively apart. During the isolation of this interminable pandemic, my thoughts return to this experience of being insomniac and attempting to sleep among strangers. In a time of curfews or quarantine orders, with increased border control measures on the local, state and international levels and magnified protectionist measures on the national scale, the question of what we have in common while physically distanced from one another has taken on increased urgency. With ethical and sometimes legal imperatives to isolate from others in the concerted effort to mitigate the spread of a contagious virus, in recent years, the term social distancing has entered everyday speech. The collective responsibility of practicing the art of staying apart brings to attention how the withdrawal of action can arise from a recognition of a fundamental entangled co-belonging. In these isolating times, it becomes even more important to trace out what underpins responsibility for unseen and untouched others. Other than isolation, this pandemic has also intensified a rhythmic disjunction. Life for some has slowed down, while for others it has intensified with little respite. It is precisely when social and transnational interactions have decreased that it becomes even more critical to dream of radical possibilities for an alternative body politic and collective life. Tai Ming Liang's Slow Walk Long March series also known as the Walker series, comprises the following films. No Form from 2012, Walker from 2012, Sleepwalk 2012, Diamond Sutra 2012, Walking on Water 2012, No No Sleep 2015, and the feature length films uh, Journey to the West 2014 and Send 2018. So my emphasis is less on the religiosity of the works 
then how the minimality of the narrative, cinematography and editing in the films reveals the vanishing nature of cinema and the, its potential for querying worlds. So in positing these films as rhythmically and thematically queer, I'm following the work of Carl Chernobyl and Rosalind Gott, who proposed that, I quote, queer cinema elaborates new accounts of the world, offering alternatives to embedded capitalist, nationalist, hetero and homonormative maps, revising the flows and politics of world cinema, and forging dissident skills of affiliation, affection, affect, and form. I'm also inspired by Annika Furman's suggestive reading of how queer desire and attachments in Apichapong Rurasitakun's films draw on and challenge Buddhist notions of impermanence and the disavowal of worldly desires. So I consider Tai's post-retirement works to suggest that retiring is a passive action that enables a proliferation of possibilities. By further renouncing the conventions of cinematic rhythms, Tai finds more space to do less. Tai Bingliang bid farewell to celluloid cinema with the release of Visage 2009, commissioned and co-produced by the Louvre Museum. So when he visited National Central University in Taiwan, in 2010 to promote Visage, Tsai expressed the fatigue of consumption and the desire for everything to be stopped. It might thus seem contradictory that his talk ended with the promotion of his coffee on sale as part of his installation, Moonlight on the River, at the Taipei Fine Arts Museum. So this oscillation between exhausted anti-consumerism and the self-promotion of his authorist coffee where he said, the coffee I sell is also food for thought, and I guarantee you it's delicious homemade coffee. If you visit the exhibition, you will understand why I have integrated the process of brewing coffee. It is part of the recycling concept and nothing in our lives should be tossed away easily. So this is indicative of the tensions within Tai's career of contradictions, of desire and withdrawal, of quietude and hints of inner drama, of passivity and relational possibilities. So in 2013, during the release of his first full-length digital film, Stray Dogs, Tai cited fatigue as he announced his retirement at the Venice Film Festival. Stray Dogs later formed Tai's first solo museum exhibition, Stray Dogs at the Museum. So with the eight-part and still-continuing Walker series, a companion internationally, uh, international travelling stage play, The Monk from Tang Dynasty, conversational documentary Afternoon, the first uh, Chinese language long form virtual reality film, The Deserted, the documentary Your Face, the short film Light, the, nar the narrative feature Days, and the short films The Moon and the Tree, as well as the short film Night 2021. Tai's post retirement work finds mobility in the dialectical dance through institutional spaces for art, cinema, and theatre. So, in the first monograph on Tai's installations, Sing Song Yong pr proposes uh, reading Tai's transmedia career through the lens of trans art cinema. And Lim Song Hui argues that the slow moving figure in the Walker series illuminates the temple of everyday life. Cinematic time captured through celluloid or digital means includes differences in cost and also practical possibilities since celluloid costs more and requires the need for real changes, which limits the length of a shot. So Tai's retirement from celluloid cinema allows for an intensification of slow cinema by a further emancipation from rhythmic conventions and what counts as cinema, ac cinematic action. Li walking relentlessly on or slipping across multiple films produces a cinema of passivity that does less in order to bring the fleshly vulnerability of interrelated beings into focus. Jonathan Query has made an argument for what he calls powering down in the face of 24-7 exploitation and exhaustion. And Jenny O'Dell's best-selling book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, opens with the truism that nothing is harder to do than nothing, and argues that doing what counts as nothing resists the optimization of life as capitalist productivity. Tong Hui Hu argues for lethargy and withdrawal as acts of political inaction within the effective negotiations of the everyday, 
Relatedly, there has been renewed attention on boredom studies, and theories have argued for the transformative potential of a politics of refusal, of non-participation, of withdrawal, and for the minimal, for the performative efficacy of saying, I prefer not to, as a form of minimal action that interrupts the operations of unjust systems. So following the footsteps of the Walker series leads to a fundamental, fundamental questioning of the multiple ways in which cinema could be an ethical political art of withdrawing from the acceler accelerationist tendencies of capitalism. Thai's experiments with sleep are shared by other artists filmmakers today. Sulia Cheng has co collaborated with Matthew Fuller on investigations of the aesthetics of sleep in museums such as Sleep 48, Sleep 79, Sleep 1237, and Sleep 5959. An Apichapong Sleep Cinema Hotel was held at the 2018 International Film Festival Rotterdam, and guests were invited to sleep in the hall while a projection screen showed Apichapong's films. As with No No Sleep, Sleep Cinema Hotel extends an invitation for guests to be with cinema, whether in watchful attention or soporific distraction. So the film Walker begins with Lee exiting a narrow set of concrete stairs in an old building as if emerging from an urban cave. Throughout the walk, his head is bent at a painful 90 degrees and in his left hand he carries a plastic bag while in his right he holds a ham and egg bun. On a pedestrian street, passers-by steal glances or stare openly at the walker but his head remains bowed as he follows the lane markings on the crosswalk. Notably, a man pushing a cart full of black garbage bags enters and exits the scene at the edge of the frame, walking in the same direction as the walker, even as they pay no attention to each other. High in the background is a gleaming royal-looking figure astride a majestic black horse. And in this frame, the sovereign, the ascetic, the shoppers, walkers and passers-by coexist in the same space without it seems sharing the same world. The journey of the monk comes to an end in the only close-up of the film where we see the profile of the walker against dark green security grills as he leaves the barn in slow motion and eats with closed eyes. While a 1974 song, A Stream Divides the Land, accompanies the final image into the credits. The song is from Sam Hui's debut Cantonese album that accompanied the film Games Gambers Play, a comedy directed by Michael Hui and celebrating the pursuit of wealth. Overlaying Thai's image, the song takes on a melancholic tone. The journey's end leads not to worldly, otherworldly enlightenment, but the solemn, sensual consumption of the bun, with the prosaic visual and oral reminder that even bread costs a few pennies apiece. So Sam Hui's song's bread and butter concerns link together the plastic of the disposable bag from the earlier scenes, the final image with the steel of the grills, the fabric of the rope, the softness of the bun, and Lee Kang Shen's flush face. These textures serve as reminders of fleshly materiality embedded in the global commodities trade that has become normalized in the visual fields of the hyper-capitalist present. How then could the processes and content of cinema that is embedded within these globalized processes, heavy with the weight of inequity, reflect on the demands and dreams of the present? In its iterations, the Walker series vacillates between entertainment and drudgery, withdrawal and participation, passivity and activity. The series enactment of slow motion is an intensification of Tai Ming Liang's earlier work that have been discussed by critics such as Song Hui Lin as slow cinema. I highlight the polyphonic rhythms of what appears to be slowness, such that even in scenes of slow motion walking, we can often discern multiple temporalities at work. As a comparative rather than an absolute term, the term slow connotates desire. If the scene lingers on and the audience is unclear what they're supposed to be looking at, the desire for more is thwarted and the film can be deemed too slow. Proponents of slow cinema share affinities with those who have called for slowing down in a culture of speed and efficacy, such as the slow food movement or the book The Slow Professor. With the Walker series, what we see is a slower cinema 
with live action slow motion that is unafraid of soliciting the revelation of boredom. So in Thai cinema of passivity, slowing down does not necessarily lead to redemptive enlightenment, but allows for a pause that lengthens the interval between movements and the creation of a quiet space within a tumultuous city. The aesthetics of passivity is only evacuated of plot-based action, but it is not evacuated of all action. In the giving of time to frames of minimal and slow motion on screen, the audience is invited to be in synchrony with the unfolding of time on screen. So in this haunted relationship to, to time, cinema is a practice of asynchrony that reserves time for synchronized encounters. The cinematic possibility that someone else could be watching the same scene at the same time or will experience the same rhythmic unfolding of scenes at another time and place creates a synchrony in asynchrony the solipsistic figure of the walker on screen performing spectacles of amplified lassitude within the arrhythmias of modern spaces is thus never truly alone in its anticipation of an audience that the scene could gather. So like his retirement dreams, Thai's work reaches towards renunciation yet remains tethered to the worldliness of everyday spectacles from the allure of Hong Kong's colourful polyphonic streets to the faint magic of Kuching's estates. The opening scene of the short film Walking on Water, set in Thai's birthplace of Kuching, Malaysia, invokes the religious mythology of walking on water with the contemplative itinerant figure of the monk, whose halting steps on water gain no notice from anyone. So Walking on Water is part of Letters from the South, an omnibus of six short films produced by, by Tan Chui Mui under the Malay Malaysian New Wave company, Da Huang Pictures. As the walker steps across a puddle of water by the side of a grimy wall, it is through their muddied reflections that we see indistinct aspects of the red rope walker, a mid-rise housing estate and a strip of clear sky. So rather than placing religion on a vertical scale of height, with the foregrounding of bending down, lying down and slowing down, the Walker series weighs down the body of the monk towards the horizontal, and the subtly subversive use of inverted reflection in walking on water is repeated in a crowded scene in the film Journey to the West, and I would now discuss the ethical political significance of Thai's shift in orientation from the vertical to the horizontal and the subtle disorientation of the West. The minimal movements of the bent body of the walker in Taipei, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Kuching and Massey cast into question the globality of Asian cinema. In the slow steps of Lee on screen, meeting the carnivalesque of the museum as an exhibition venue, and inter interactions between the passivity of Lee's body and the series location shooting across global cities, there's a collision of what Tina Chen has called the multiple overlapping and embedded contradictions and the structural incoherence of global Asia's. So through the Walker series, there is a chance to rethink the potential of the transnational from the emergence of the interrelational in a way that can trouble the concept of the international world as the multiplication of nations with internal units of distinct individuals. So the 16th century writer of the classic Journey to the West is given writing credits on Thai's Journey to the West. And while Wu Chang'an's classic novel was a literary account of, Tang, of the Tang Dynasty Buddhist monk Xuan Zhang who travelled to the western regions referring then to India, Thai's Journey to the West shows a rogue figure of Li already in the so-called western world of Marseille, France. In place of Xuan Zhang's disciples, the mythologized and beloved cast of folk religion inspired Monkey Pig and the Sand, Sand Monk, Lee is followed by Denis Levon, a French actor from the mythological universe of art house cinema. And in his perspicacious reading of Journey to the West, Song Hui Lin highlights what I quote the ethnic difference within the body politic of the modern nation state of France in the post colonial space of Marseille that is magnified by the appearance of a pilgrim from the east in the cityscape. So Naki Sakai has challenged us to conceive of the transnational as 
what he calls the foundational modality of sociality and to understand that nationality is a restrictive derivative of transnationality. The West has persisted in its mythical hold over the political imagination despite its bloody colonial baggage and imprecision. So in the film Journey to the West shifting of the referent of the West from India to Marseille, the signifier of the West also shifts as it has in history. The film is composed of a non-teleological following of one actor by another and it begins with an awakening and ends in an inverted suspension, maintaining the possibility of an upside-down, a rhythmic sociality in the public square which for an extended moment suspends the ossified orientations of East and West. The first image of the film is a close-up of Denis Lavon's face in a supine position his expression is inscrutable and shadowy. He could be waking up or, fall, or falling asleep. And in the film, Lavan follows Lee across Marseille but at a different pace. So unlike the solipsistic ambulation shown in The Walker, Journey to the West suggests the possibility of rhythmic sociality. However, while Lavan follows Lee, his presence is not acknowledged. It is the audience that completes the triangulation of faces and as the film looks for strangers half asleep or half awake in the dim light of the museum, in the gallery space with throw pillows on the floor, some audience members mirror Lavan's initial horizontal position. And Ty's Walker series puts pressure on the habitual disorientation of daily life and social interaction, such that the walking body is weighed down by the horizontal line. So in these passive, vulnerable postures, the Thai's work brings into public light, horizontal sociality gestures towards a temporary suspension of hierarchical and other presupposed differences. The film ends with a long take of an upside-down, reflected white shot with people milling about a public square and the tiny minimal figure of the walker at the edge of the frame. So in the long take and white space of this inverted vision, the figures in the square are granted an opacity. Here, there is a flicker of a utopic co-belonging in a busy, public, transitory space. Yet there is still a palpable rhythmic difference between the walker and the other anonymized figures with barely discernible faces. It is only the rhythms of walking that distinguish one body from another. On screen, a solipsistic walk is set against the colors and rhythms of public coexistence. So like his declarations of retirement, in Thai cinematic war, the acknowledgement of impermanence and solitude begets desires for queer, asynchronous rhythms of possibility. Of the films in the Walker series, the voluptuousness of queer desire is most pronounced in the film No No Sleep. It comprises a series of static shots scattered in the urban locations of Tokyo, a pedestrian crossing, an overhead bridge, trains, a bathhouse, and a capsule hotel. The film opens at Shibuya Crossing, the world's busiest scramble intersection. We see pedestrians cross the intersection in every direction, but the walker is nowhere in sight. He appears in the next shot on an overhead bridge, and his excruciatingly laborious steps are shown from various angles. The few passers by in the scene pay no attention to one another. This is the only scene of walking in this film. In the slowing down of steps, the weight of the interval between movement and non-movement becomes more pronounced. With each step, there is the anticipation of a possible future, of a social world to be entered. But within this scene, the walker finds no pardon from his solitary existence. And even the static camera, camera is restless, and before long, its attention leaves the walker as an audience might attracted instead by the libidinal energy of the night. The camera from the position of a train leaving the platform brings the viewer for a night tour of the city, showing, in a blur of light and shadows, the passengers in another passing train and the restive energy of the phosphorescent nightscape. The sequence ends with overexposed, blown out, obscure images of people and the city mixed with indistinct contours. A hard cut transports us to a long take showing a full frontal nude shot of the actor Masanobu Ando soaping himself alone in a narrow communal shower. 
In the next scene, Lee and Ando sit side by side in the waters of a public bathhouse in silent, proximate distance. Finally, the walker is silently, rhythmically in sync with another body. So as we emerge from or persist in social distancing, this scene of being tremulously together, connected by the same body of water, but without direct contact or dialogue, takes on a renewed pathos. The aesthetics of passivity extends from content, the sense of queer proximity in isolation, to form, interrelationality mediated by cinematic possibilities. The intense moment of Lee and Ando being in proximate distance is followed by an image of Lee shown in a close-up sweating in a sauna. Over the decades of their intertwined careers, it giving more rather than less cinematic time and space to the various movements of Lee's body as it is weighed down by age and time, Thai cinematic earth forms a rhythmic longitudinal study of a specific body's transformation and transformative potential. In its passive modes of observing Lee's body, Thai cinemas perform an ethical attachment that is queer in its refusal to discard an aging actor's body according to capitalist practices of consumption with expiry dates. The film ends in a double supine suspension between sociality and withdrawal, as well as between insomnia and slumber. And in the penultimate shot, from the point of view of a camera positioned at the end of the narrow bed, Ando sleeps or does not sleep alone in a cubicle hotel room. So as he tosses and turns, his nude lower body becomes intermittently visible beneath a narrow tin sheet. And the final shot, similar in camera positioning and anger, shows Lee with his eyes closed and most of his body covered underneath the sheets. So in both shots, their bodies are partially doubled by their own image in the reflective surface of the wall. And the concluding sequence of shots are and Ando and Lee in proximity, Lee alone in a close-up, Ando alone in a capsule hotel's bed space, and Lee alone in a similar-looking space. So this short form, a rhythmic, erotic, slow dance of quivering passive desire. So even though they are isolated frames, this desirous sequence highlights the ethical erotic event marked by the vulnerabilities of the flesh that is at rest, or almost at rest. In the absence of physical touch between the two, the editing allows a proximity of touch across the cinematic frames. And at the end of No No Sleep, what we are left with is not the sweaty textures of the face or the intervals of slow steps, but an open vulnerability punctuated by soft breaths. So the intervals of breath from Ando and Lee disperse from the screen to the nocturnal exhibition site. The nights at the exhibition offer entertainment soak in celebrity culture, a modality that is not often associated with Thai Ming Liang's slow cinema. The exhibition drew a disparate crowd of all ages, including children and crawling babies who stayed overnight in blue tents. Thai sang for hours to live piano accompaniment, sometimes by himself and sometimes with his guest stars. He sang Mandarin songs from his films by Yao Li Zhou Xuan, Li Xianglang, Songs in Taiwanese, and children's songs for the gathered children. Whether due to the hypnotic allure of Li Kangxia multiplied on two screens, the draw of the guest stars, or the amusement of a family camping night at the museum, hundreds of people packed the museum on weekend nights. And other than promotional appearances in universities around Taipei and the athletic book chain as he did with Stray Dogs, Tai recounted to his captive night audience how he walked the streets during the day to hawk tickets to the public, a practice he began with the film What Time Is It There? So from street canvassing to turning the museum into an insomniac space, Tai's cinematic practice renegotiates the borders of high and low art, art house cinema and popular entertainment. And so much depended on the allure of the director as a charismatic figure. As he strode to, through the seated audience in the museum, holding his mic, belting out the tune and bantering with the audience, Tsai resembled a celebrity reveling in the adulation of the audience. On the night of Fan Weiti's guest appearance, Tsai paused the looping No No Sleep to show a music video promoting a song by Fan, starring Lee Kang Sen. After that, and the customary duet between Tsai and his guest, No No Sleep was set to, set to loop again 
for the faithful who were staying overnight. And thus makes the sacred and the profane the director as sage, entertainer and salesman. Tai's refrain that he made almost every night of his appearance was some version of the question, is this still a museum? So just as he desacralized and eroticized the embodiment of the legendary Xuanzang, so too did the desirous carnivalists infiltrate the night at the museum. Yet in the hours after the fanfare, when the films looked on in the quiet, the boundaries between the museum, the cinema, the audience as either passive or active were laid even if only temporarily to rest. The convivial atmosphere of the interactions between Thai, the museum goers, the films, the special guests, and the interplay of light and opacity between the screens, sleepy bodies, and the world beyond the glass windows melded into one another and into memory as night turned to dawn. The pandemic brought about painful global closures and restrictions on spaces of collective appearance, including the cinema theatre. So during these years, the virtualization of the cinematic from the material basis of the elements of cinema, such as the theatre, has become more apparent. Through the Walker series, we could consider the innermost possibility of cinema as rhythmic interruptions that offer possibilities for attunement to alternative modes of being together. Some years later, when I read Alan Klima's invocation of what Alan Klima called the silence that eased my mind and filled me with the bare and ordinary presence of the world, myself in isolation returned to the moment of the vanishing screen and the bodies of intimate strangers in a space no longer public or private. In passive postures of sleep, inertia or insomnia, these bodies in horizontal assembly perform an ethical political possibility of being together as vulnerable strangers mediated by windows and screens, holding in abeyance the question of who the others are, where they come from, or what language they speak. So as the mechanisms of the world slowed down during the COVID-19 pandemic, and physical movements through the passages and networks of the world became restricted, and as the world reshapes itself in this aftermath, the urgency of retaining a place and time for an ethics of, and aesthetics of passivity should not be forgotten. The downward movements of slowing down and lying down offer rhythmic counterpoints to a future conceived of as accelerationist progress. Globally, we are at a moment when sleeping or lying flat is a collective political gesture. And the horizontal inclinations of the Walker series anticipate the 2021 phenomenon of Tang Ping lying flat in China that has caught on as a social protest movement against overwork in the pursuit of elusive material goals. In an age of extractive capitalism that has been termed the capitalism in order to foreground the entwinement of capitalism with colonialism rather than the Anthropocene that attributes the ecological crisis to the human species as a whole, the exhaustion of humans and the earth is sometimes seen as a capitalist achievement. So under the logic of maximal extraction from the body, where rest and sleep are deemed wasteful and unproductive, to be horizontally inclined is a passive act of refusal. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, independence is a very interesting term. I think um, one of the, I mean, the larger um, argument that I want to make really is to rethink the notion of independence um, and kind of have the idea of interrelationality be prior to the question of independence that is tied to a finite unit, such as um, an individual. So of course I understand that um, historically for many reasons including colonialism, um, national independence has been very important right in um, like in the countries that you mentioned. Um, um, however, what I wanted to really emphasize um, especially in the section of the <coughs> talk where I quoted uh, Naoki Sakai is uh, for a way for us to think interrelationally and to think about um, the transnational um, 
as yeah as something that is very like a fundamental unit that is more than the addition of different nations, right? So and the reason why um it, I mean independence is a very interesting term is that when we think about so on the one hand historically um this kind of independence from colonialism is definitely uh, something that many people in many countries fought very hard for and uh, it's very important to to acknowledge and to take very seriously right but then on the other hand um i also wanted to to stress right that with a like if an over emphasis of independence whether on the individual or national scale can lead to the um like a problem of um like closing up into silos of or being kind of too fixated on um the the borders and walls right of whether the individual or the nation and with the pandemic we saw this return to uh forms of like hyper nationalism of forms of um kind of having to of protectionism of of um certain nation states right of like kind of um this is mine first this is me first rather than um like thinking equitably on like a global and transnational scale so i mean you you also raised the question of culture so i think one thing that i've always uh, wanted to emphasize in my work on slow cinema is because sometimes um slow cinema is associated with certain cultures from southeast asia um uh, because some people say life is slower there which is i guess a very racist way of thinking right so because slow cinema um there's examples of that whether in american cinema european cinema right and of course across southeast asian cinema i'm not saying that there's no differences in the experience of time but i think that um slow cinema is like a is an important possibility that is um sometimes in the content of how the director films but also in how um in exhibition conditions in how um how audiences are invited to experience a work Right, so like for example, in a in a context such as um, the Taiwan Fest, right, so, so slow cinema is always uh, possible outside of like uh, essential notions of of culture. Well, I think um, well, Tai Milang is uh, a very well known um, like Malaysian born um, director, um, and then you also have um, this director um, Lau Kei Huat. Right, uh, and Lucky Hot is um he works both in the um documentary and also um in in the uh fictional uh fictional films, right? And what's I gonna say? Yeah, and actually um I also work on Kate Watts' work, and his work is actually very di directly relevant to this question of uh, Malaysian independence. So, for example, his uh, debut documentary uh, feature film, um, documentary film, um, Absent Without Leave, is precisely on um, the um, the exile of um, pe people who participated in the uh, Malayan Communist Party, who also contributed very much to. Um, this like fight for for freedom and independence in Malaysia. So that's film is um, absent without leave. And Kei Kuat uh, Block Kei Kuat starts from this um, investigation of um, his uh, his own childhood and kind of the missing presence of his uh, grandfather and his kind of emotionally absent father to really trace this family history that is caught up in um, this uh, yeah cold war of um, of the period. Right, so I mean that's definitely a documentary film that I will recommend, and Lucky Hua also has the film Follow Me, um, on kind of the, um, like new villages and kind of the history of the of the moment, um, of of that period, and you also have uh, another director, uh, Ho Wee Ding, uh, who made the film uh, Pinoy Sunday, and also very recently a film Terror Rises, uh, so these are two examples of Malaysian filmmakers who. Who have um I mean I would say Malaysian born I'm not sure with that nationality at this point but who have really um uh, work within like Taiwan cinema and I from my observation Taiwan has been very kind of open in welcoming uh, regional filmmakers to and very supportive of filmmakers from the region. Yeah, thank you for your question. So, um, with my partner Lai Ritia, I run uh, BNW Films. We are a small film production company, um, and we work on uh, short films and feature length films. Um, so our most recent uh, feature film was a uh, Taste by uh, um, Lei Bao, which actually won uh, the top prize at the Taipei Film Festival um, last year. 
um, and generally the films that we work on uh, are based within the Southeast Asia or um, Taiwan region. So I, we, we rarely, um, generally are, are less interested in working um, on works that are primarily set within um, Europe or America. However, in working on the Southeast Asian films, we have um, like international co-production partners from, uh, from generally from Europe as, as well as Southeast Asia. I don't want to generalize on the Southeast Asian film industry because it's, it's so varied and there's so many changes and it really, there's a lot of differences from, um, from country to country depending on the scale and kind of productions. Um, and I mean, it is with the Southeast Asian production. So for example, with Taste, uh, we have, um, like it was, the film was made in, in co-production Right with uh with European partners, uh Southeast Asian partners, and also uh we have a uh, like investor from Taiwan. Um, I would say really um a lot of the differences can be due to um like I, yeah I really wouldn't want to generalize even to a country uh, not to say Southeast Asia because um it so much can depend on really the kind of project that um the di the director wants to do the kind of. Um, the kind of team. So I'll say that at this moment in Southeast Asia, um, like film productions, is very exciting because there's just um, like quite a great a variety and diversity of the kind of works. There are, there are people making genre works, people making like slower works, people making like um, kind of more uh, commercial productions uh, versus more film festival oriented works. I think with Tai Mei Lang's film, um, I mean, he's a uh, very across his career, right? If I can think about independence in, in the sense of being very like obstinately, stubbornly sticking to the cinematic world and the ways of filmmaking that, uh, that he wants to pursue, right? So we can see that um, despite like uh, facing challenges in the box office whether or not the film is winning awards or not so through through the years like through different formats from cellular to digital through accepting commissions from like different festivals finding fun funding from different places even to uh, the, and i made a brief mention that um like he would even sell tickets like in um on the street right or to his for people to watch his film so i think it is a kind of very courageous um, like refusal to capitulate to to conventional expectations, whether it is um, uh, for his films to look look a certain way, be a certain way. So I think um, like this is a and and another aspect of the his independence which I brought up is um, is absolutely um, kind of unrivaled fidelity to the body of an actor Lee Kang Shen. So no director I know has has had this kind of um, like long-term uh, commitment right to filming the body of this one actor right so when you watch like if you were to binge watch uh, Tai Mei Liang's film you will see Li Kang Shen age right you will see his body become more frail right you will see um, and in his later works um, Tai Mei Liang actually addresses right like Li Kang Shen's uh, body being in pain so I think that that's something of a very beautiful in so again back to uh, what I wanted to emphasize on interrelationality. So, like, so early on, I talk about how Tai Ming Lang's work is so fiercely independent because, um, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of, um, of rhythm, right? He does not uh, follow uh, expected conventions. But on the other hand, this independence won't be possible without this uh, long-term collaboration. Right. And Li Kang is not the only person, right? There are, there are other um, actors, right, and other people that um, Tai has worked with recurrently, but just focusing on this uh, body of Li Kang for now, right? So that this independence is only possible uh, because of this collaboration with another body, which is uh, part of my emphasis, right? That, that the unit of the individual um, can always be preceded by the interrelational unit, right? That it is really in the social that. Um, that things can begin, right? Whether that's that's art or something else. Thank you. All the best for your festival. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it to the festival in person. Yeah. Take good care. Okay. Bye. All right. Taiwan Fest explores the stories of independence. Indulge in Indonesia. Discover Malaysia. TorontoTaiwanFest.ca.